but it looks like it's clearing up out there. But when it's dry, we cry for rain, and when it rains, we want it to quit. And I'm just glad the good Lord takes care of all that. Doesn't leave it up to us. All right, if you have your Bible, turn to John 4 with me this morning, please. Father, I pray for the gift of teaching now, Lord. I pray for unction, understanding in the Scripture. In thy holy name, amen. Do you know what the card is? Gray Dodge Stratus. Lights are on. So, uh, might want to go out and check on that. John 4, 21. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when ye shall neither in this mountain, that is Mount Gerizim, nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Israelites. That's what a lot of them would like you to believe. But what did he say? Salvation is of the Jews. Now, uh, just a little bit of historical context. Mount Gerizim is the location of a Samaritan temple. And the Samaritans were the, uh, as you know, the half-breed Jews. And uh, Which chapter 4, John 4. Mm -hmm. John 4 and verse 21. 21 and uh, uh, 21 through 23. John chapter 4. This is the, uh, this is the story of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ as he meets the woman at the well, and she's a Samaritan. And the Samaritans were half breed Jews, and uh, they had a temple in, in, uh, at Mount Gerizim. When Joshua and the children of Israel went into the Promised Land, the law was reread to them. And Mount Ebal was on one side, and Mount Gerizim was on the other side. And Israel was split in two. And he read the law, and the blessings were from Mount Gerizim, and the curses were from Mount Ebal. And so, therefore, from that day on, Mount Gerizim was associated with blessing. So, the Samaritans built their temple on top of Mount Gerizim. And to this day, they're there. They're still there. They offer, uh, they offer sacrifices uh, as they did then. It might be for you, you might want to look that up sometime and look at a... At, at a uh, at some of the sacrifices that are made at Gerizim by the Samaritans. And the Samaritans have what's called the Samaritan Pentateuch. And the Samaritan Pentateuch is very, very similar to the Jewish Pentateuch or the, or the Hebrew Pentateuch, which of course it lends to credibility because the two of them trace their, their, uh, their source all the way back because they are almost not identical, but there's so much about them that are like. And, um, so they had their own temple, they had their own priesthood, they had their own Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They had all that, and they worshipped on Mount Gerizim. And so this is what the Lord Jesus is referring to here in John 4. He said, you say upon this mountain is the place to worship, Gerizim, but we say in Jerusalem. And then of course he corrected her and said, salvation is of the Jews. The source of truth, therefore, does not run through the Samaritan. The source of truth runs through the Jews. Now, it's important to understand what's going on here. Because the Lord made a clear statement that salvation is of the Jews. Now, as I told you last Sunday morning, there are those who teach that the Jews are a product of the tribe of Judea, or, or Judah rather, which is in Judea. And they're a product of that tribe. And that therefore they are cursed and scattered to the ends of the earth. Then of course you can get a different take on it. Let me tell you this at the beginning of what we're talking about here this morning. You're going to find that regardless of what you get into, whether it's the New Age movement or British Israelism or whatever, you're going to find that there is no universal, consistent uh, doctrine that these people adhere to. It's kind of like cafeteria religion. You go through and say, well, I like this. I like the color of that. This smells good. And then you create your own religion by the time you get to the end of the line. Uh, that's New Age movement for sure because they don't agree among themselves. And that's what you get into when you get into this business of British Israelism. They don't agree among themselves either. They have a lot of uh, conjecture. You can get on the Internet and go to YouTube and you can find a lot of material on there 
about uh, British Israelism in its various forms. And all of this, of course, is to diminish the authority of the Bible. Now, what book of the Bible are you finding this in? Verse number 4, chapter 4, rather. Gospel of John, exactly. And John is written somewhere, 90, 95 A.D., somewhere along in there. It's the last by far, the last book, of the last gospel written in the New Testament. Now, they will challenge me. You'll find scholars that will say, oh, no, 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 no. Matthew was written about 135 A.D. On and on it goes. The reason I believe that John is the last one is because, first of all, the author of it. Who wrote it? John. And he was the longest living of all the apostles. He outlived every one of them. He was the longest living. John. Number two, it's the fact that it has nothing to say about the Sermon on the Mount. It has nothing to say about a Jewish kingdom. Therefore, it is not contemporary with Jewish thought and Jewish movement of that day. It was written after that. All right? That's another reason that I believe that the Gospel of John is late. And then, of course, the message of John. The message of John from John chapter number 1 all the way through the rest of the book is about salvation, whether Jew or Gentile. Makes no difference. For whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. The Gospel of John is, is addressed to anyone. These things are written that ye might believe. Not Jew. He said not just Jews, but Gentiles. They can believe. And the burden of the Gospel of John is belief. New Testament, salvation, saving, belief. So, uh, this puts it late. And by putting it late, it gives you an idea of what's going on here. Now, there are four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Of these four Gospels, which two would you say for certain were four, were two of the original twelve apostles? Matthew and John, exactly. No question about it. Matthew is Levi the publican, and John is the Apostle John who was with him. He was Peter, James, and John with the inner circle. What does that do then with Mark and Luke? Who are they, you see? Well, you get into this thing of authorship. This is part of scholarship and all this stuff. Who wrote the book? The Gospel of Mark is more than likely written by John Mark. All right. The Gospel of Luke is written by Luke the physician. Now, here's the problem with this. Not, not a problem to me, but this is their take on it. That Mark and Luke were not of the original twelve. They were companions of the Apostle Paul. You remember what I told you about Paul? Remember how I told you how they're demonizing Paul? And the reason they're demonizing Paul is because that he's the one who received all the mysteries. He's the one who established the Church of God's foundation about the gospel of the grace of God. And that he's the one who confronted Peter in Galatians 2 and all this. That Paul, the apostle, is the one essentially who opened up the door into the future for the New Testament church. We have the, we have the Hebrew roots movement. We've got uh, British Israelism. We've got, uh, we've got these people that are on the fringe. I mean, they are, f which I guess left <laughs> is the way to say it. They believe in, they believe in aliens and, and, and rept reptilians walking amongst us. They believe in all this stuff. They don't like Paul. Uh, you've got a lot of people that don't like Paul. Remember Thomas Jefferson, what he said about him? said he was the greatest corrupter of the Christian religion. Of all, uh, apparently, of all that he read. Now, no doubt in my mind that, that Thomas Jefferson was well read. No question about that. But he did not like Paul. So the list continues to grow of the people that do not like Paul. Now, here to me is one of the reasons, and to me is probably is one of the major region, reasons that people do not like the Apostle Paul. And that is that Paul fixes the Jew. He places the Jew where he belongs, and he places him there dispensationally. The Apostle Paul says that the Jew has been blinded, and the day is going to come when God opens his eyes. And we're going to deal with a little bit of that, and I want to show you what it says in Romans 11, and show you that the, it just jumps off the page of the Bible to give you an idea of what's going on here when we're talking about the Jew. Now, a man came to me a couple of days ago, and he said that uh, the church where he attends, he said the pastor got up in the pulpit and said, God is finished with the Jew. He's done with him. And that's it. He's finished with him. 
He's done with the Jew. And of course, when you make a statement like that, I say to you, well, what is Romans chapter number 11? What is Revelation 7? What is Revelation 14? What's that talking about if he's done with the Jew? And, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, then there you have well, there's those who are called praetorists is a different perspective on prophecy. A praetorist is one who believes that all the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled. And for the last 2,000 years it's been, it's been fulfilled. And so we're living right now on the edge of time waiting for the rapture or the coming of the Lord to come back. Well, I certainly believe we're waiting for the rapture and the coming of the Lord. But folks, this world has seen some tough times, no question about it. But it has not seen what's coming in the book of Revelation. Amen. That tribulation period, the Lord said, except it be shortened, those days should be cut short. No flesh should be left alive on this earth. And I would not in any way diminish what's coming in the tribulation period. This world has never seen that. Even the Black Plague of the Middle Ages, as horrible as it was, uh, it can't hold a light to what's going to come when the tribulation period comes down to this earth. Now, uh, when you get these things in perspective and get it laid out and get the chronology of it laid out and begin to look at it, then it helps you put things together and it helps you understand the situation today. A oh, soul, I'd say to myself, all right, then you're a Jew. You're, you, in other words, you hate Jews. And so Alfred Rosenberg uh, traced the Jew through history and he was instrumental, very instrumental in helping form the mind of Adolf Hitler in his hatred of Jews. And the Jew becomes the pariah of all mankind and blaming them for all the world's problems. And so once, once you demonize a people like that, then you can just, you can do away with them. And that's exactly what they did. But is it based on, is it based on truth? Is the Jew the pariah of the world? You see, this is what we get into. And when you go to the Bible, Will the Bible bear that out? I'm not interested in what some sage wrote a thousand years ago. I'm not interested in what some philosopher sitting in his, in his sealed room today is saying about the Jew. What does the Bible say? Because once again I say to you, I'm a Bible believer, and the Bible is the absolute arbiter and authority over anything we deal with. It makes the final decision. So let's look at the Bible. Let's look at what it says about the Jew. Let's see if we can find in the New Testament where the word Jew and Israel is used interchangeably. If we can find that, then we've found the heart of the issue and we'll make our point. If the word Jew and Israel is used interchangeably, say, why, that's, why is that important? Because British Israelism teaches that the ten northern tribes uh, represent Israel, the Israel of God, and that the Jew is not the same as the Israel of God or the ten northern tribes. Let's look at it. In the book of Acts chapter number 10 and verse number 28, the apostle said, You know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into one of another nation. Who said that? He went to the house of Cornelius to give you a clue. What apostle went to the house of Cornelius? Peter. Did Peter call himself a Jew? Yes, he did. Did the apostle Paul call him a Jew? Galatians 2.14. If thou being a Jew, the apostle Paul said of himself in Acts 21.39, I am a man which am a Jew. Now what tribe was Paul from, by the way? He was a Benjamite. That was the smallest of all the tribes. In Acts 28, verse 29, we're going to get a chronology now. We're going to set this thing in time. In Acts 28 and 29, if you look at verse number 28, you'll see the Apostle Paul's preaching. He said, Be it known therefore to you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these things, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. All right, now what happened right before that? And you'll see the connection here now. Look carefully. Look at verse number 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word, and he quotes Isaiah chapter number 6. 
saying, Go unto this people, and saying, Hear ye shall hear, and shall not understand, seeing see not, and not perceive. The heart of this people is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, so forth and so on. Now, who's he applying that to? Jews, Jews exactly. All right, that's the key. They're called Jews here in the book of Acts chapter number 28. And it is clear in the Scripture that God is blinding them. Now, when you get that, you need to understand that that's going to lead you somewhere. If you go to Romans chapter number 11 now with me. Romans 11. Romans 11 and verse number 7. Romans 11, 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now look at verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them, them who? Well, who's he talking about in verse 7? What's he call them? But what did he call them in Acts 28? They're connected then. See the connection? The interchangeable use. In one passage they're called Jews, the other passage they're called Israel. Remember this is important. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, quotes Isaiah. And uh, talking about how that God hath blinded them, and uh, He has blinded them in a judicial blinding. Look at verse, uh, Romans chapter number 11 and verse 8. And He's blinded them. Then in verse number 25, Romans 11 verse 25. I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to who? Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Watch this. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Now, let's make, a, make an application here. You're a British Israelite. You're Israel now. All right. You're one of the ten northern tribes. Okay. And you're a Christian, I see. Oh, yes. Well, then who's he talking about here in Romans 11 when he says they are enemies of the gospel? See the connection? This is Israel that is an enemy of the gospel. Are Jews enemies of the gospel? Yes. If I, I, you know, the Torah teaches plainly that Christ is illegitimate, that now He's all kinds of, you know, I don't even want to talk, say where they say He is, and all this stuff. They are enemies of the gospel. The Jew is. But here in Romans chapter number 11, what's He call them? Israel. So, if I, if I, if I profess to be a a British Israelite, and I profess to be the ten northern tribes, the Anglo-Saxon people, that I have, a, I have a divine mandate from God to bring the kingdom of God to this world and rule over the world. And they do, folks. This is why the British Empire, 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 spread its wings to the ends of the earth. The idea is we're going to, we have a mandate from God to rule the world. And, and the idea is that we are the, we are the, uh, we are, we are, our kings are sitting on the throne of David. And we can trace the coronation stone all the way back to Jacob. All that stuff. But they profess to be Christians. Yet the Israel that's found in Romans chapter number 11 is the enemy of the gospel. Do we have two Israels? Or one? We've only got one Israel. But notice. He blinded the Jews. Then in Romans chapter number 11, the Jews are blind, but they're called Israel. They're connected now. They're called Jews in one place and Israel in the other. That's important because the British Israelite wants to take the Jew and put him here and Israel over here, and he wants to separate them. I want to show you how the Bible connects them. They, this, this separation is an arbitrary thing. They reach in there and they've done it with no authority whatsoever. The Jew and Israel is is connected and you can't separate them. So, if I see that the Israel is the enemy of the, of the enemy of the gospel, I look at 2015 and I say to myself, you're dead on. They still are the enemy of the gospel. They are. They're the enemy of the gospel. 
They do not believe the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah, folks. The Jew does not believe that. You say, well, I know a Jew who is saved. Well, he's, he, racially he's a Jew, but religiously he's not. He's a Christian now. Was the Apostle Paul a Jew? Yes. Was Peter a Jew? Yes. Were they Christians? Yes. <coughs> Can you be a Jew and be a Christian? Absolutely. But here's the thing. If you try to practice Judaism and mix in Christianity with it, then what you've done, like the Hebrew Roots Movement and others, then what you've done then is, is adulterate and pervert the gospel of the grace of God. And that's what's going on right now, right now in the pulpits. They're telling people that they need to, uh, they need to go back under the Mosaic Law and that the laws were never uh, 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 done away with. But the Lord Jesus says, not one jot or one tittle will ever fail of the law. But He said, I came to fulfill the law. And the righteousness of the law, now the law is going to show up again. Yes, it will in the future with Israel. But the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. The righteousness of it. And it was never fulfilled in anybody in the Old Testament. Nobody could ever live up to the standard of the law. They all broke it. And the Apostle said plainly, couldn't bear is a burden we couldn't bear. Paul said that. But it comes back to this. If I try to deal, if I try to talk with these people like I'm talking to you this morning, they'll say, oh yeah, but here's the problem. You're talking about Paul, and you're talking about Luke, and you're talking about Mark, and that's the authority you're quoting because Paul wrote Romans, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts, Acts 28. That was, therefore, he was corrupted by Paul when he talked, when he made the application of the blinding of Israel. See this? Are you following me? Acts 28 is written by Luke who was, who was, who was uh, under the influence of Paul. And so they arbitrarily reached back to the book of Isaiah chapter number 6 and made the application of how God had blinded the Jews and then connected them with Israel in Romans chapter number 11 and said that's all a product of the Apostle Paul. And I have to say to them, well, you have to make a choice. Either you believe the Bible or you don't believe the Bible. And I believe that all 66 books of the Bible are inspired Scripture. And let's take, for example, a good example, uh, the book of Jude. How many of you know in the book of Jude when it talks about uh, uh, Enoch, uh, the seventh from Adam, preached, and he said, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of His saints. And all of this statement that it says in the book of Jude, is that correct? Absolutely. Why is it correct? Jude said it. Why is it correct? Genesis talks about Enoch. He was the seventh from Adam. He disappeared. He was no more for God took him. But there's also a book of Enoch. A book of Enoch that no doubt probably has got a lot of good stuff in it because I've been in this thing many times and seen the quotations from it. But here's the problem. It is not canonical Scripture. I will never use what Enoch says to correct this book. If what Enoch says agrees with the Bible, good for Enoch. Book of Enoch I'm talking about. But apart from that, it is not the authority. The Bible is the authority. So you've got to stick with the book. And when it comes to the identity of a Jew and Israel and all this stuff, you, what's, my, what's my authority? Well, somebody had a vision. They've got a word for us today. Keep your word to yourself and change your diet. It might affect your vision. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but uh, it doesn't matter what they say, all of that. The book is the book. Amen. So I believe Paul is an apostle. He says, born out of due time. The Greek word there is literally, uh, he, was, uh, 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 he was one who was aborted, brought forth before his time. Uh, he was one who, who uh, his time would have been later because he was to minister to, to the Jew. But his time was soon, God called him. And I believe he's inspired, and I believe every word that Paul wrote is inspired Scripture. I believe that every word that Luke wrote is inspired Scripture. I believe every word that Mark wrote is inspired Scripture. Same with Matthew, and the same with John. Now, here's what sets Matthew apart from Mark, Luke, and John. And here's the biggie. This is the biggie. Matthew is the only gospel that has what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, Luke has a Sermon on the Plain, which is very similar, but they're not identical. But Matthew is the only gospel that has the Sermon on the Mount. 
You say, why is that important? Because the Sermon on the Mount, and this is not to diminish it one bit, but the Sermon on the Mount is the gospel of the kingdom to the Jewish people establishing a kingdom right here on this earth. Therefore, if I'm a British Israelite, which gospel am I going to elevate above the rest of them? Matthew. Matthew. I'm going to elevate Matthew above Mark, Luke, and John. Now, do you see how this stuff goes when you get into the New Testament? And, you get, and these people get very rabid about this. You have, uh, you have uh, Dominion Theology. You have uh, Hebrew Roots Movement. You have, uh, you have all kinds of, uh, as I said a moment ago, wild, crazy stuff that's going on. <clears throat> but let me put this in here right now while I'm talking about this. I've done some more reading about CERN. And I don't know if any of you ever followed up any on what I gave to you last Sunday morning. And right now they've started up this Hadron Collider in CERN, Switzerland, Switzerland and France. They border in, in the thing 17 miles long, three, three, uh, 300 feet underground. They have started this thing up. And uh, it's my understanding it's going to run for six months. Six months. And uh, Stephen Hawking, along with some other DeGrasse and some other scientists, have given a warning that they could literally be opening uh, to be to, to put it in our terminology, the gates of hell, because it could literally destroy the universe. This is what Hawking says, as we understand it, uh, as, as I understand what he's saying. He could, it could be destroying the universe. Well, now that's that's the, that's the physical manifestation of it, but there is a spiritual manifestation of it, and it gets very sinister. Because antimatter is also referred to interchangeably as dark matter. And when you start talking about dark matter and antimatter, you're talking about a whole new world that doesn't come under the laws of physics as we understand them. And they'll tell you that in a heartbeat. And that's what we need to be focused on right now. We need to understand that, that paranormal, paranormal, manifestations are taking place as it relates to CERN. And that I told you that Shiva, there is a round thing there in front of the, uh, in front of the headquarters there in CERN, Switzerland. Shiva is doing the dance of destruction. Shiva is part of the Hindu trinity. Shiva, Vishnu, and uh, what's the other one's name? Pardon? Brahm. Brahm's the creator. Shiva's the destroyer. Vishnu is the preserver. This is the Hindu trinity. All right. And I told you, remember I told you a long time ago, well, it hadn't been that long ago, I told you where that, that Hinduism, Buddhism, and all of that came from Brahmism. Brahm is the granddaddy of all of it. Shiva is inside this circle that represents the cosmos, it represents creation. And Shiva is doing the dance of destruction. This was given to the scientists from CERN by a scientist, the scientists from India, who are, who are participating in what's happening. All right, here's the problem. Here's the problem or the observation of it. Shiva destroys the dance of destruction, but it's for a good purpose. Because once Shiva destroys, then Brahm, Brahma, comes along and recreates, brings into existence something from the destruction. This is what's happening at the Hadron Collider. They fire these protons and whatever else they're firing, particles, best way to use it is to use a generic term particle. They're firing these particles inside this, this uh, accelerator, this collider. And when they hit, they release things. And for just a very short time, very, very, very short time, something comes into existence that has to be observed. And what is coming into existence that they're observing is what they are building this whole system about to try to determine what caused the Big Bang in the beginning that brought everything into existence. In plainer words, the glue that holds it all together. You remember I talked about that last Sunday morning. At the very moment 
that creation came into existence, whatever brought it into existence at that moment does not exist today the way we see things and understand them. If we can go back to that point to where this happened, then we can observe what took place and we can see where it came from and observe observable things that, uh, that are unknown to us now. This is the idea of CERN and this is what's going on right now. Now, I'm not saying I agree with all this stuff. I'm just simply laying it out there for you. But here's the problem. They are having paranormal manifestations from this collision that they didn't expect. And that there is a energy attached to everything in the universe. And that when this collision takes place, it causes this energy to be manifested in a particular way. And that these supernatural paranormal beings are drawn to that energy. And they have no idea of what's going to come from it. That it, is, it doesn't react the way that normal matter reacts because it's antimatter. It fits in an entire, it's, 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 uh, it's like going into a virgin forest that's 3,000 miles long and you have no idea what you're, expo you're going to expect to run against as you move into that thing. This is what's happening here. It's all new to them. And, uh, and it's releasing things. As I, told you, as I told you last Sunday morning, I personally believe that Satan is using this to connect science and religion. And I hadn't planned on saying all this this morning, but I might as well say it while I'm at it. The Roman Catholic Church has an observatory on Mount Graham. And that observatory is like the Hubble telescope. This is a high-tech thing looking off into the heavens. And they've been making statements now for the last few months about how that there is definitely alien existence up there. And that uh, they, they put this hypothesis out to the people and said that if there is alien existence up there, then they're part of God's creation. We should welcome them when they come down to us, if they're not already here walking amongst us. And that uh, we need to understand how we're going to incorporate them into our culture and our life and, and make them part of what's going on here. And so we need to prepare ourselves for that. And now the Pope has jumped on the bandwagon. And the Pope is making statements about this. And so therefore the Roman Catholic Church has become the vehicle to cause whatever's up there to come down here and unite with mankind and the scientific community is being brought into the thing because the Hadron Collider is producing this stuff over here they didn't expect, all these supernatural manifestations. They put this image of Shiva out there in front of the thing. What you've got is simply this. You've got the whole world right now on the verge of accepting beings from up there and it'll be scientific. And you and I both know this morning that this world worships at the altar of science. You're living in the midst of a generation, folks, two generations, three generations, that have been raised in infidelity, agnosticism, atheism, and, that, and as far as they're concerned, this is the most irrelevant book on earth. It's meaningless. And so therefore, they relate, to, they relate to each other, they relate to life, they relate to everything according to their science, the science of evolution and everything that followed from it. This is where they are today. And it blows my mind at some of the stuff I've seen this past week, some of the debauchery that's going on in Canada and places like that. It is unbelievable at how low that mankind has sunk. Did you know, folks, that in Germany, and you can check this out, just I'll check everything I say out, please. In Germany, they have brothels for animals. That it is not, that apparently the Germans have passed a law or whatever in Germany, that it is not a, a crime to uh, bestiality. And so now they have professional, they have brothels in Germany, of all people. It's quiet in here. You know why? Sometimes a shock of reality will shock you into where we are right now. This is 2015. We've never been here before. Amen. It's like the Lord said to Joshua and them, He said, you're about to go down a path you've never been down before. 
We ain't been here before. It's bad out there, folks. Real bad. I watched a parade, a photograph of it, of a, 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 a gay pride parade in Canada. Gay pride parade in Canada. Forget what you see on CBS, NBC, ABC, and the rest of them, folks. Please, forget it. If you want to know what a gay pride parade is about, look at some of the photographs that they take of what's marching down the street. They'll never show you that on CBS, NBC, ABC, and the rest of them. They'll whitewash it. But what I saw, and it's not, it's not just an isolated case of one photograph, many of them. I saw a photograph of these old men walking down the street, stark, raving, naked. I'm talking about completely naked. And, a, and these people standing on the sideline cheering them on. But the most telling thing of that photograph was this. Children standing in there. And here was a little girl about this big. And she had her hands on her face. Apparently the only one with enough sense to have shame about being subjected to this raw, gross perversion. And I thought to myself when I saw that, and you want children to raise? What would you do in the, in the, in behind the walls of a house? If you're going to do that in public, if you're going to march down the street in public in front of a little girl, pervert, that blows my mind. What would you do behind the walls of a house if you had children to raise? That's where we are, folks. That's not where we're headed. That's where we are. And a lot of the gospel in Canada has been shut off. You know why? They call it hate speech. Yes, sir, you had something? That was in 2008. Well, they've had another blowout, but not the same kind of blowout. They shook the earth this time. This time, the, the, the voltage is in the trillions, trillions of, uh, I forget what kind of voltage it's called. It's not like the voltage in your wall over here. Electron, the, volts. electron volts, yeah. Trillions of it. And, and something happened. And I haven't been able to read enough on this thing to find out what's going on, but it, it wasn't expected. And it, and, and, it, uh, and it shook a bunch of stuff over there. So as I say, they're, they're, they're venturing into the unknown uh, with this thing. Uh, but what if, what if it does open? What if Satan does use this as the opportunity to, uh, in Revelation chapter number 9, the gates of hell, folks. The door of heaven is in chapter 4 and 5. The gates of hell is in chapter 9. From the highest to the lowest, that's what you get in the book of Revelation. And Revelation, by the way, is outdated. You know that. You don't need to be preaching from Revelation. It's not applicable today. Yes, sir. Preacher, I can't help but read this. When you said what you said about the shame that little girl felt. Yeah. Jeremiah 6, 15 says, Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down. Yeah, that's good, brother. No, not ashamed. They're proud, man. Oh, boy. They should have been arrested and thrown in the clink. Amen. They should have. Amen. They should have. But they let them walk right, and they were guarded by the police and by the authorities uh, because they have their right to parade themselves, stark raven naked, down the middle of the street, and the people are cheering them on on the side. So what's that say about the people? See how far it is? You think the Lord's not going to come back sometime here soon? So how much worse can it get? It'll get to the point, as I've said to you before, folks, right on the altar. They'll have their uh, Aphrodite, Diana, uh, the, uh, the fertility goddesses. There was a whole class of fer fertility goddesses that stayed at the temple, and it was through the uh, uh, cohabitation that they worshiped their God, and that's exactly what's coming to the so-called Christian church they're going to do it right on the altar, right in front of people, and it's going to be part of the worship service. That's right. And it'll, it'll, it'll happen, as sure as you hear me. Yeah. It'll happen. It won't be the church of God. No. Church of God's leaving out of here. Amen. All right. Well, we've covered quite a bit of ground in here this morning. 
uh, <laughs> I hope that, uh, I think I pretty well covered everything I had. I've, I've, uh, I've tried to show you how that a Jew and Israel, one and the same, that there is no such thing as a British Israelite, and British Israelism, and Gentiles, and, and the Anglo-Saxon people who, uh, who say that they, are, uh, that they are the Israel of God. Uh, the New Testament makes no distinction between a Jew and an Israelite. Israel, same. And the Apostle Paul, of course, is the one that did it. And if you can demonize Paul, then you'll demonize, uh, you'll demonize that, and a lot of them do. As I told you before, the Jefferson Bible, he cut huge portions of it out and said, uh, determined to himself, uh, this is what should be in the Bible, and throw the rest of it out. There's a, a counterpart to that in the Old Testament, it's Jehudi. You remember him? Yeah. In the book of Jeremiah, he cut out a big portion, took a pen knife and cut it out. Didn't like it. Threw it out. Yes, sir. Yes. That's the key right there, the window. They have to, they have to do something in a, in, a, in a space of time. And I don't know, I don't know how close that is. Uh, a good source of information, the Debka file, Debka, it's published uh, by the Israeli military. And they'll keep you abreast with a lot of what's going on. But you always remember this, always remember this. That what you're reading for public consumption is for public consumption. And there's no doubt a lot of things happening in the background you're not going to read about. You're not going to tell your enemy what you intend to do. When, well, yeah, we, ain't it a good thing he'll be gone in a few months? Hallelujah. You talk about it. You talk about it. <laughs> That'll be wonderful when he's gone. Yes, sir. You're talking about like a bunker buster bomb, something yeah, like that. that. Yeah. The, 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 your, your authority for that is it Jane? Yes. Jane? Okay. Uh, I personally believe that when it comes to technology, uh, uh, I believe that uh, when it comes to technology, I do, I, I do not believe that Israel is second to anybody. No, I don't believe they are. And like I said a moment ago, they're not going to tell you everything. No. They're not going to tell you. The window, as brother mentioned. Here's the odd man in this thing, and I hope it doesn't happen. You ought to pray about this. Lord, have mercy, help us. Pray that it does not happen. That if Israel launches a strike against Iran, that this president up here does not call in our forces to shoot Israel's jets down. all Christians that voted for him. You want to have a revival in America? When they start walking down the aisles with the tears running down their face, hot tears of repentance, and say, Lord God, forgive me for who I voted for and put in office. God, forgive me. Yes, sir.
Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Here's what you need to consider about Iran and Israel and Israel right now. Iran, no, they see Obama as a very weak, and their window would be that if we're going to launch a strike against Israel, we need to do it when Obama's in there before they get another president. You know, that's their window. So, you know, we may be coming right up to Armageddon, right up to the point. It may be sooner than we think. My biggest prayer of all of this, though, is that the United States does not shoot down Israeli jets. Whew, man. Yes, sir. That's right. Yeah, well, we see in the part of the fullness of the Gentiles where the Jew is blinded in part. That's exactly where we are. And if that event could take place as far as the rapture of the church or the ones if were a new creation in Christ was one not the wrath, and God himself uh, delivers it. Well, there's two or three things going on there. Number one, Israel will be saved as a corporate body at the second advent when Christ comes back and appears to them and they see Him. Number two, and it, it says this, it says, And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. We're in the times of the Gentiles. Start at 606 B.C. The vision of Nebuchadnezzar will run its course until the second coming of Christ. We're in the times of the Gentiles right now. Israel, the, the only thing that's protecting Israel right now is Michael. And Michael, and of course, all it takes is one archangel. He can do the job. But he's protecting Israel at this moment. Michael. That's, that's who stands for Israel. And, and no bomber, no jet fighter, no, no trident uh, submarine. You're wasting your time to try to fight against an archangel. We've run out of time. We'll pick it up again next week. I like it, though, when you ask questions and get involved. I hate it. People go to sleep. I'm doing something wrong. Amen. <laughs> Brother Lee, dismiss us, please.